that. All right, if you remember back in the uh, middle part of the 1980s, there was this little movie that ah, it became fairly popular. It was called Top Gun. Yeah, Tom Cruise, Val Kilmer, uh, Anthony Edwards. And, you know, that story, of course, was uh, based on uh, real-life people and real-life instances. Well, joining us this morning is someone who was integral in that whole Top Gun phenomenon. He is Dave Bio Baranek, and he joins us this morning to talk about his new memoir called Top Gun Days, Dogfighting, Cheating Death, and Hollywood Glory as one of America's best fighter jocks. Dave, good morning. Welcome to the show. Hey, good morning, Gus. Thanks. Thanks for that great introduction. Uh, yeah, I hope a lot of people remember Top Gun. It, it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> no, well, I don't know. What what year did Top Gun come out? It was 80, what, 86? It was re- released in 86, yeah. Okay, 86. And I remember, ba- uh, you know, back in those days because that was, uh, yeah, I was in my mid-20s then. And uh, back in those days, I mean, that, that was really kind of the movie that shot Tom Cruise to superstardom, wouldn't you say? Uh, I think so, and there, there's uh, actually a BBC TV program that says that also, um, you know, yeah, that's what a lot of people think. When he showed up to film the movie, we, the instructors there, had an idea. Yeah, we've heard of Tom Cruise and stuff like that, but but one scene, one thing that just illustrates that he was still yet to arrive. When we met him one time, we were in a bar, and we spent about an hour talking to him before anybody came up and asked, are you Tom Cruise? Ah, so he was uh, still reasonably unknown. Yes. And yeah, yeah, okay. And by the end of the filming, though, we, we were seeing things in the San Diego paper. You know, Tom Cruise was spotted here, and he was doing this. So, yeah, I mean, people knew who he was, but that was really his, his, uh, his launch pad. Well, we want to talk about your part in the movie, but before we do that, tell me a little bit about yourself, Dave, how you got to, well, first of all, how you got to become a naval aviator. Was was that something that, as a little kid, you had dreamed of doing? Did you have you know relatives that were uh, aviators? How'd that work in your life? Uh, it was something I dreamed of from uh, the time I was probably 12, maybe a little bit younger, and I wanted to be a pilot, and uh, so I had to become an officer, so I had to go to ROTC in college. So, so those are the steps, and I think, or, or one of the academies. Well, I chose uh, ROTC. And then while I was in college, my eyesight went bad. And so you can't be a pilot if you don't have 20-20 vision. Yeah. So luckily, the Navy was introducing the new F-14, and that had a back seat for a radar intercept officer uh, who didn't need good vision, but he was along for the same ride, the fighter mission, et cetera. So I became a radar intercept officer. Ah, so in the movie, then, you would have been Goose. Exactly. Very good. Yeah. There you go. All right. Yeah, Dave Biobarnick is with us this morning, and we're talking about his Top Gun days. He's written this, by the way, in an awesome book. Now, look, if you're, you know, if, if you saw the movie Top Gun and you got caught up in the whole Top Gun craze and, shoot, who among us didn't, uh, you're really, really going to like this. He's got all kinds of color photos in there and just talks a lot about uh, first of all, his career and uh, life, like kind of in the Hollywood scene too, which he kind of got thrown into. Now, when you became a naval aviator, I know a lot of people have this question, and I'm sure you've been asked this a million times. Your uh, your handle, your nickname, Bio. Uh, how do how do people get a handle? Uh, how how is it chosen? Did you choose it yourself? Or was it chosen for you? And what does Bio mean? Gus, that's a good one. Uh, they ask ensigns, you know, just as you're getting ready to join your first squadron. They say, what do you want your call sign to be? And a lot of guys, you know, they want to be tiger or killer or shark or something. But by the time they get to a squadron, the they're still new guys. They're brand new. They don't know anything. And you've got all these seasoned veterans there. And so the guys in the squadron, you know, they want to call them, you know, something goofy like goofy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when they asked me what is what do I want mine to be, I thought, okay, my last name's Baronic. It rhymes with Bionic. I said, I'll, I want to be called Bionic. And so when I got to my squadron, they said, what do you want your call sign? I said, Bionic. Well, you know, I was six foot two and one hundred and sixty five pounds. I wasn't very Bionic, but the guy that I flew with shortened it to Bio, and that stuck. Wow! Very cool. Very very cool. Uh, Dave Bio Baronic is with us this morning, and I'm Gus Lloyd. You're on Seize the Day on the Catholic Channel, XM 117 and Sirius 159. Now, it, just tell me a little bit, first of all, about your training. When you, you know, you said that it, from 12 years old you wanted to be a pilot. Uh, when you first started out this whole thing, Dave, was was it all that you had dreamed that it would be? Was it all that it was cracked up to be? And what were some of the, you know, what were some of the the uh, the things that you maybe became a little disillusioned about? Gus, you are really, you're hitting the good points. One thing that I realized shortly afterwards is there was a lot more to being in a fighter squadron than I ever suspected. 
you, you have to run the squadron. You have to become an expert, of course, in the tactics and the, and the equipment. And so it really is. It's, it's a real career. You can make it a full career. It's not just zooming around the sky, et cetera. Uh, one of the big disillusionment things was I found out that I got airsick. Yow. So I showed up in Pensacola, went on my first flight, and I got airsick. Well, luckily, I persisted through that, and, and I got over it. Now, when when you get airsick, especially like on that first flight, and I, I hope this isn't going to be too graphic for a morning radio show or anything like that. But yeah, you do. Okay, so so they have that. Did you did you have to use it that first time? Oh yeah, and more than once. No, but no. Okay. And, and the great thing was, in, in my case, uh, and in, and some of my buddies got airsick also, and some of the lucky few never did. But you know, I would just okay, use my little barf bag, and then I was right back in the action, ready to go. And, and after just a few flights, I started to get over it, and eventually uh, it wasn't a concern. So it is something, I guess, that, uh, that, that you can get over, something that you just kind of learn to deal with. In some cases, right. Right, right. Okay, now tell me a little bit, too, Dave, about the, about the physicality of the job. You know, we hear about how when you go into, uh, you know, X number of Gs that the blood all drains from your head and you have to learn breathing techniques and whatnot. Is that all true? What, did you, what, what about the physical aspects of the job? Did you have to keep yourself in top condition all the time? Oh, that is true, yes. And a lot of guys uh, were real uh, gym rats, and uh, I would say I was a modest. Uh, I wasn't really a gym rat, but I just stayed in basically good shape. But, for example, when we were dogfighting, and I go over this in, uh, in Top Gun days, you know, I describe it in, in great detail, but when we're dogfighting, if you're pulling six Gs, uh, which was pretty common in the F-14, that your, your arm would weigh like 60 pounds. And you've got to move it around to activate a switch or to grab a handle and help yourself turn, turn around or something like that. Your head, you know, it's hard to say how much a person's head weighs, but with the helmet and everything, it, under 6 Gs, it probably weighs like 90 pounds. And, and so it is something to get used to, but once again, uh, after a few weeks and a few dozen flights and everything, I found myself really adapting to that nicely, and so it wouldn't bother me at all. Wow, this is fascinating stuff. Dave Bio Baranek is with us this morning. Baranek is with us this morning. And his book is called Top Gun Days, Dogfighting, Cheating Death, and Hollywood Glory is one of America's best fighter jocks. Dave was a flight instructor at Top Gun School and uh, became heavily involved in the production of the movie Top Gun. Dave, this is fascinating stuff, and I appreciate your time this morning. Now, let's talk a little bit about, uh, well, first of all, when they first uh, approached you, and uh, the folks at Top Gun at the Top Gun Flight School uh, about the making of the movie and how you became involved as kind of an integral part of uh, of the uh, you know what is it the, the design of the movie about keeping the movie real sure. I guess that's that's what you really did. Well, there was uh, there was one gentleman at the squadron who was the uh, lead, and uh, that was uh, Admiral uh, Robert Willard, and he's actually a four star admiral now. He and uh, so and he deserves that. It's not related to the movie, believe me. <laughs> but but he put in a lot of time to take their initial idea and uh, make it a lot more realistic. And all the instructors basically got involved a little bit, either explaining something to the actors or showing them or something like that. Uh, and so I spent some time, I remember one of my specific roles was showing them how to climb up on an F-14 the natural way, you know what I mean, or the way that a professional would do it. Uh, they said, you know, okay, they just walk up to this big jet and it's hard to figure out how to get on. I go, okay, look, you, you walk up like you're real confident, you throw your one hand up here and grab this and step here and all that and they're up. And then near the end of the filming, they had about twice as much aerial air-to-air -air sequence as they expected and so they needed a couple of people up at Paramount to help them write dialogue for all this. So a pilot and I went up there and spent uh, two days working with Paramount and wrote a lot of that dialogue, or wrote all that dialogue that they use when they're flying. So, so it was kind of like real dialogue, what you guys would really be saying and communicating to one another in dogfight scenarios. Well, we were at, around that time, we were really refining our, uh, our communications and our commentary, and we really don't talk quite that much. But the, for the, uh, the director, Tony Scott, kept saying, oh, we need you to talk a lot, talk a lot. And so we just, you know, turned it on and we just became blabbermouths. Right. So it's a li little bit more than a typical uh, pilot in Rio would say. But, but yes, it's very, it's realistic, yeah.